Hello, I'm Mark Payne of the West Virginia Humanities Council. Welcome to History Alive. History Alive is a program of the Humanities Council that brings historical figures to life through portrayals by presenters who have conducted thorough research into their character. These presentations are both entertaining and educational. The Humanities Council makes these characters available to nonprofit organizations across West Virginia, such as schools, libraries, historical societies, and a wide range of community groups. The presentation fee is paid by the council, and we ask only that their travel costs be covered by the host group. History Live is designed as an interactive experience between the character and the audience. We encourage your organization or school to host a presentation and bring a figure from history for a visit with your audience or students. Having someone like Harriet Tubman or Stonewall Jackson come to speak to your group can breathe life into these historical figures. Nothing compares to the live in-person visit. Each presentation consists of three parts, a monologue, a question answer session with the character, and then the presenter breaks character to answer questions about how he or she conducted their research. Our History Lab presenters have researched a variety of sources such as diaries, journals, letters, official documents, autobiographies, and the research of other scholars in developing their character. A History Lab presentation is not a play. It is an audience participation event that relies on interaction between the audience and the character. Being able to ask your own questions of these important figures from the past is a unique experience. It's difficult to reproduce the feel of an actual History Lab presentation here in the studio. Without an audience to ask questions, we will change the format a bit and have our guests sit with me for a few questions after the monologue. But we hope to give a sample of how a History Live presentation can add to the offerings at your school or organization. There will be information on the screen at the end of this program for how to contact the Humanities Council about bringing a History Live character to your community. At this time, I would like to welcome today's guests from history. We are pleased to have with us in the studio, Osborne Perry Anderson. I, Osborne Perry Anderson, I spent most of my adult life in the fight to eradicate an evil institution that has hampered our nation. That institution being slavery. I also happen to be the one person who can tell the whole story of the singular event that brought about the end of slavery in the United States of America. But I definitely believe the most important event, what transformed America, what gave the perishing slave hope, took place in Harpers Ferry, Virginia on October the 16th, 1859. And I am the lone person who was with the great John Brown that can tell the whole story. I began working with the Underground Railroad in Westtown Fellowship in Pennsylvania. As a young man, I partnered with a family there, the Shad family, Mary Ann Shad, a brilliant woman, newspaper editor, perhaps one of the first female newspaper editors in America. And this woman of color established the Provincial Freedman, an anti-slavery journal that we published and I, learning the trade of a printer, became the devil's printer for, for that work. Now, in 1850, Congress passed a law that in September of 1851, the president, Millard Fillmore, signed called the New Fugitive Slave Law. What this law did was it said any person from any part of the country could go anywhere in America and claim you to be their slave. 
and you had no recourse, no rights to prove that you had never been a slave, to prove that you had been a free person. But at that person's word, you could be forced to be taken into slavery. Ironically, many free whites were kidnapped and lied upon saying they had colored blood in them and taken as slaves. People of color born free all of their lives, kidnapped, forced to go into slavery with no legal recourse. As the abolitionist worked for freedom, there was one man, Dred Scott, who tried to use the courts for his freedom. Dred Scott, going into the Northwest Territories, sued for his freedom based on the fact that having lived in free territory, he should be granted his freedom. The case went all the way to the United States Supreme Court, and Judge Taney ruled in the final reading that no person of color had any rights that a white man had to respect. These things caused thousands of free Negroes to flee the United States. I and the Shads were among those that went to a community not far from Detroit in Canada called Chatham West. But just that little crossing across the border gave us a whole new future whole new freedoms. In Canada, we could go to school. We could run for uh, government offices. Uh, you could vote. You, could, you had all of the rights and privileges of any of the citizens there. And so the Underground Railroad set up Chatham as its headquarters. We would help the escaped slaves make it into Canada, give them a plot of land, give them a start in freedom. Well. The great John Brown had heard that there was a, a community of men there that he could gather together to present a plan that he had to end slavery in the United States of America. For he felt that it would be audacious of him, a white man, to come up with a plan to secure freedom for black men and women, and they have no say-so in it. So he wanted to start from the very beginning like the founding fathers did, have a convention. And this convention was for the oppressed people, all of the oppressed people in the United States of America. And he wanted to set up a provisional government. Why a provisional government? Because he believed in the United States of America. And he did not want to destroy or hurt his country. But he wanted these people to live under their own government, under their own rights, under their own constitution, until they were accorded their just rights here in the United States of America. And so he, in April of 1858, he came and met with Dr. Martin Delaney and asked him to call together a convention of men to discuss this matter. I joined Delaney and others in preliminary discussions to plan the convention. When the convention took place, John Brown came with about 12 of his men. There were about 60 people of color there, some of us free, working with the Underground Railroad. Some of them were escaped slaves. But at this convention, we declared that slavery was the most barbarous act of one person against another people that could ever take place holding people in perpetual bondage, and that these people had a right to do anything that they wanted or needed to do to secure their freedom, and that we would no longer serve as slaves to any man, but would live as free people and only work when we were compensated justly for our labor. This constitutional convention also elected delegates, one of which I was elected, to represent the people. We had a president, a secretary of state, a secretary of war. Yes, 
For we realize that this freedom would not just be simply given to us, but perhaps some bloodshed would have to take place. But our goal, as I say, was never to overthrow the government of the United States of America, but to be as the Indian, a nation within a nation, with our own government, our own laws, until we were accepted as American citizens. But John Brown had an addendum to this plan. But there also had to be a military action. Certainly, just because we had a meeting or convention and we voted on certain articles, that the United States government, and particularly the South, was certainly going to abandon slavery and give us our freedom. No. But what was his plan? No one knew exactly. But John Brown would let us know when the strike was to take place. It was in September of 1859 that I got word something was going to happen and that I was to leave Canada and to come to Harpers Ferry, Virginia. I traveled there, some by train. I reached Chambersburg, Pennsylvania, where John Brown met me and escorted me to the Kennedy Farm in Maryland, about four miles from Harper's Ferry. That was where our secret headquarters was. John Brown took on an alias of John Smith. Smith and Sons were doing a farming business. This was an excellent location because we could use the Underground Railroad connections in Pennsylvania to aid us. We could have our supplies shipped to nearby Chambersburg which it would not be far to go and to, to pick them up. But as a person of color, this was a hard and trying time. For you see, we could not sally about forth uh, as farm workers as the white participants in this army of liberation. We had to hide in a loft in the Kennedy farmhouse or night. We had to be quiet, careful not to be seen. Oh, how we waited and hoped for the night to come when we could come down from that hot loft and sally out into the night and breathe some fresh air. But during this time, that's when we learned how religious John Brown was. Every day we started our morning with a morning prayer. He read and quoted scripture from the Bible. One day, we were waiting for some reinforcement. There were other men, and Harriet Tugman, with some of her men, was to come and to join us. But people had been coming uh, around the farm and seemed to be getting suspicious. And fearing that some of our plans may have been divulged and there may, may be a raid on the farmhouse, John Brown decided not to wait for reinforcements. And on the night of October the 16th, he told us to gather our arms and we would proceed to Harper's Ferry. We loaded our arms into the wagon. We proceeded walking in couples, just a, a couple of us apart. We cut down the telegraph wires and so forth. And finally, in reaching the city, we secured the armory, the arsenal, and the rifle factory. We were supplying slaves in the area with pikes. And our hope was that we could divert them into the Appalachian Mountains and form a chain of warriors all the way going down from Maryland into Virginia, into North Carolina, South Carolina, Georgia. And as these people went into the mountains fighting for their freedom, it would strike a blow against slavery. Well, you all know the end of the story. John Brown and many of the brave men were killed. John Brown was captured and hung. And I am the only one of the 17 raiders that went on that raid to survive. However, I lived long enough to become a recruiter for the United States Colored Troops 
during the Civil War. And this Civil War was definitely brought on greatly because of what we did at Harper's Ferry. In recruiting for the United States Colored Troops and fighting for the United States Colored Troops, now we are not rabble risers, rabble rousers or whatever, but we are part of the American government. And when the war ended, over 200,000 black soldiers and sailors took part in their own liberation, just as John Brown had hoped for. And now, we were no longer a part of a rebel band, but we were a part of the nation's army that had secured freedom and ended slavery in the United States of America forever. I'm here with Mr. Osborne Perry Anderson. Mr. Anderson, I want to thank you for taking time to be with us here today. And uh, I, I want to take a few moments here to ask you just a few questions. Uh, first off, would you tell us a little bit about uh, your early days? You were born in Pennsylvania or? Uh, yes, I was born in West Fellowship, uh, Pennsylvania. Okay. And I, I heard uh, when you were speaking earlier, um, you, were, uh, you became a, a printer at some point or early on? Or, or? Uh, yes. Um, I began working as a farmhand for a family in Pennsylvania. It was the, the Shad uh, family. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, Mr. Shad's daughter, Mary Ann, was publishing and editing an anti-slavery uh, newspaper. And so I got involved with her and uh, learned the, the trade. I became an apprentice and later an apprentice. So I became the printer for uh, for that uh, anti-slavery newspaper, and that was the, that was the Provincial Freedman. Uh, yes, was that paper, and uh, so you you became pretty involved with the Underground Railroad, did you not? What was what was how did that come about, and 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 what period of time was that? Uh, it was in the 1840s. Uh, when, as I said, when I first became involved with the Shad family mm -hmm. in the late 1840s, and then not sh uh, shortly after that, the Fugitive Slave Law was passed, in which uh, so bringing the uh, fugitive slaves to Pennsylvania was no longer uh, a safe haven mm -hmm. because the authorities could pursue them there, mm -hmm. and citizens or the state would be obligated to. Uh, return uh, the, the men or women back into slavery. Mm -hmm. And so therefore it was thought that the headquarters should be moved to Canada where, where they had no authority to pursue the slaves. And that's when we moved our operation from Pennsylvania to Chatham in, in Chatham West in, in, in Canada. And that was near Detroit? Uh, yes, uh, yes, just on the other side of the uh, uh, border from did, Detroit. Did uh, American officials ever attempt to to bring, to return slaves back from Canada, or was that pretty much off limits? Uh, it, it was pretty much off limits. Uh, the, the Canadian government would protect you. The American military had no authority. Of course, you would always have uh, maybe a, an individual or something who would try to maybe cross the border or kidnap someone, mm -hmm. but it would be very dangerous. They, could, they would be captured. They would be, you know, be uh, or put into prison. Uh, so you had a much... Uh, a, a very good chance of defending the slaves' freedom. And then you had a free black community that would fight, you know, uh, they, they, uh, in Canada, you could carry guns, you could fight for your freedom. Mm -hmm. So hey, you just couldn't walk over there and take somebody. <laughs> yeah, okay. And so that made all the difference in the world. I'd say. So then uh, you, uh, of course, you become involved with uh, John Brown and his plans um, uh, on the, for the raid on Harper's Ferry. Could you tell us a little bit about how that, you know, when that plan sort of started to become, uh, when it was born and how it, how it evolved and, and what your role was in, mm -hmm. in, in that operation? Well, uh, by the grapevine, uh, we had all heard of John Brown. We knew uh, what he had done. And uh, the nickname that, that we had for him was Osawatomie Brown, you know, because of the, the raid in, in, in Kansas. But in April, of 1858, John Brown came to Canada 
and he wanted to secure a convention of men of color to present a plan that he had to end slavery in the United States of America. And uh, he had heard of a uh, one of the men working with the Underground Railroad uh, that had quite a reputation, Dr. Uh, Martin Delaney. And so he felt that Delaney had the influence and had the contacts to bring together this convention of men and that Chatham West, where you had an educated, free black community, that this would be the place to, uh, to, to hold such a convention. And so he contacted uh, Dr. Delaney uh, Delaney introduced me and some others to him, and we formed a committee to set up for this uh, constitutional convention where we would proclaim uh, freedom for the slaves. Mm -hmm. So when did you know during the, during the course of the raid that it was not going to succeed and that you, you needed to, to take uh, steps to secure your own safety and to make your escape? How did that come about, and what did you do? Well, we were... Because you were the sole survivor of the raid, is that correct? Yes, we, we were to secure uh, three locations. Uh, it was the uh, engine house, or the fire engine house, the armory, and the rifle factory. Of course, uh, we were hoping to secure uh, weapons and, and, and guns from the uh, armory and the um, rifle factory. And then John Brown was headquartered with the men at the, at the engine house. And we had also had brought some hostages uh, uh, with us and some, uh, and some freed uh, uh, slaves. And so when the militia came in and the engine house and uh, the armory was uh, surrounded, and uh, John H. KG, who was with us in the rifle factory, sent word as he saw the militia coming in to John Brown that now was the time for us to, to, to leave. And John Brown would, uh, did not leave at that time. So they were surrounded. And so then KG himself tried to go to uh, aid John Brown, and he was killed. Uh, then uh, uh, John Brown sent one of his sons out with a flag of truce, and he was shot. And so and we saw that everyone uh, was surrounded. And at that point, Albert Hazlitt and I, we were the only two left at mm -hmm. the rifle factory because KG and uh, the other gentleman, had, uh, Watson, had been uh, killed. So uh, we made our way out of the back uh, from the rifle factory. And some of the, uh, I don't know whether they were escaped slave or freed black, but uh, they helped us to, to find our way uh, uh, back to the river and secure a, ca a canoe in which you could paddle across over to the other other side of the uh, line of Virginia into Pennsylvania, and that's how we uh, be began trying to make our escape. And you said ultimately you made your way into Canada? Uh, yes. Uh, actually, we spent a couple of nights in the woods in Virginia, hiding up in the mountains. Uh, we could hear the hound dogs searching for us. Uh, we had to lay down in the, in the river to keep the dogs from, from getting our, our, yeah. our scent. And, we, and hearing those dogs bay, I can still hear those, those, those sounds. Mm. And, uh, but eventually, we made our way back into Pennsylvania. And Hazard, he had become very uh, ill, and he wanted to make his way toward his hometown. And so we thought that it was best that we split up. And unfortunately for uh, Hazard, he got caught, and, but I was able to escape. Mm. Well, I'd like to say now that this isn't really Osborne Perry Anderson. This is actually... Joe Bundy of uh, Bluefield, West Virginia. Joe, thanks for being with us here today. Joe is one of our most uh, experienced and uh, uh, long-standing History Live presenters. We're proud to have you as part of the program for sure. But I, I will ask you what I ask everyone who does this show, and mm -hmm. you've done them, you've done these shows before as well. Uh, what was it about uh, Osborne Perry Anderson that you know that, that you, you you found so interesting that? made you want to research him and, and develop this character, and how did you go about doing that? Uh, well, I had met uh, a historian from California uh, named Jean Libby, and uh, she uh, had been at a conference 
in uh, Harpers Ferry. And a, a, Harpers, and a Charlestown native, Jamaica Kenyatta, who was also at this uh, meeting. And through them, I learned about the life of uh, Osborne Perry Anderson and uh, his association and work with John Brown. And John Brown had always been a, a hero uh, uh, to me. And so I found out that, I found that through Osborne Perry Anderson, I was able to get a greater insight into the the life of, uh, uh, of John Brown, and particularly uh, during the time of, of the raid and, and his association with the, the men uh, uh, who participated in yeah. that. So what was, uh, what was Anderson's relationship with, uh, with Brown, did you find? Uh, he was in Brown's inner circle. He was, he was held in high regard. Uh, Brown had a committee to uh, do the preliminary work for the Chatham Convention, which was similar to a constitutional convention or similar to the convention that our founding fathers had at that, that little church in, in Richmond when, when the nation got started. And so along with Dr. Delaney and William C. Monroe, uh, uh, Osborne Perry Anderson was a, among the, the, the committee to organize the Chatham Convention. And so to, to have that standing with John Brown, he must have been held in high regard. Also, Brown was very aware of the black abolitionists uh, community and who were the movers and shakers in, in that community. And so he had probably heard of Anderson's work in, in Pennsylvania and Canada. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think obviously that, uh, that Anderson held Brown and pretty had a lot of respect for uh, Brown as well too. Uh, yes, he respected Brown for his carriage. He respected him for his religious faith. He said uh, every morning uh, before they would eat, the, the, uh, they would start the morning, they would rise early in the morning, and, and have prayer. He said, well, Brown hardly ever did, made any decision or did anything without first uh, reading a Bible scripture or, or having prayer. And then uh, just when they would you know, sit around or have talks or discussions or, or whatever, he found him to be a very pious person, to be a very, very honest person, and to be a person who believed in total uh, equality among all people. And, and that was what... I think Anderson admired so much about John Brown. Yeah, I mean Brown, he felt didn't wasn't just about abolition, but was about abolition and uh, yes. equality. Right? Yeah, a, a lot of abolitionists, for example, they didn't agree with with uh, they hated if they felt slavery was wrong, but for you to have a menial job or for you to make less money than a than a white person or that you be denied a, a right to an education or whatever, uh, some of the uh, they did not ha uh, believe that. But John Brown believed in total equality, and as Anderson said. When you sat at his table, whether you were a black man, a free man, a slave, or whatever, you sat at the table with his wife, his children, his family, you all uh, uh, ate together there. He talked with you on the same level as he would talk with, you know, with anyone else. And then the idea that he felt that these uh, black men in Canada, for example, were just as wise as the John Adams, the George Washingtons, and the Thomas Jeffersons, and they could have that same type of a, a constitutional convention to establish a government for their freedom showed his belief in the equality of, uh, of, of, of mankind. Hmm. Well, here in the last 10 seconds or so, uh, he, uh, Anderson passed away at a relatively young age in what, 1870? 1872, 72. yes. But he did survive the war and lived to see a lot. So I want to thank at this time uh, Joe Bundy of Bluefield for portraying uh, Osborne Perry Anderson for us here today on History Live.